Okay. <clears throat> so our first keynote speaker is the managing director of Health Futures of, of Microsoft. Uh, he currently leads Microsoft's efforts to connect the real life biological scenarios, Dr. C, to the depth of medical knowledge through the use of generative AI to help speed up the diagno diagnostic processes, which, which in turn allows to the right care at the right time. Ladies and gentlemen, UW alum, Jonathan Carlson. Awesome, thank you, Chris, and uh, thank you for the invitation to be here. As, as Chris said, I'm a, a UW alum. I graduated uh, with my PhD in 2009. Uh, at the University of Washington's Computer Science Department. And I had the privilege, sorry, as I launch this here, let's see if we can get this all up and running. I had the privilege of being part of the Interdisciplinary uh, Computational Biology Program, which was a cross-cutting, uh, university-wide program that not only provided interdisciplinary training, but more importantly, provided an interdisciplinary community, which was so important for my own uh, personal uh, career development. What I'd like to talk about today is uh, a lot of what my team has been working on for the last, depending on how you count, five or 10 years, but what has really exploded on the scene, uh, both within our company, but also across the world. And that's what I'm gonna call today the emergence of general AI, and specifically uh, for biomedicine. I love what Dr. Shaidoff said, that AI is just another tool. Uh, it is a tool in the toolbox. It is a profoundly weird tool. It's a profoundly powerful tool. Uh, and, and I wanna dig into that a little bit today. But first, I'd like to start off with three questions, because I'd like to get a little bit of audience participation. I've, I will warn you, I've asked these questions uh, in every talk I've given for the last year, so it's always interesting to see what the responses are. So first question, uh, by show of hands, who here has actually played with ChatGPT or something like it? This is awesome. I have to tell you, uh, this might be the highest percentage of any uh, audience that I've seen, although I guess over time you'd expect that. Uh, as you know, this is the most rapidly adopted technology in the history of technologies, and, and for good reason. It is a very surprising technology. It, it interacts with us in a way that we didn't expect technology to be able to interact with us uh, before it came out in November of 2022. Second question, have you played with GPT-4 or one of the three GPT-4 class of models? And by this I mean GPT-4, uh, Google's Gemini, uh, what do they call it, 1.5 Ultra or whatever it is, uh, 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 Claude 3 Opus. So what, what was that, about 10% of the room? 15% of the room? Also, one of the highest I've seen, I'm very proud of you for that. If you haven't, what you have to realize is that these different generations are nonlinear step functions. This is just a plot of the performance of, GBT, of chat GPT-3, the uh, chat GPT, the free version, which is based off uh, 3.5 versus GPT-4 on a, a series of, of standardized AP exams and, and similar tests. And we see a massive step function. If you haven't actually played with and really immersed yourself with the latest, then you have a pretty big gap in your understanding of what's possible. Third question, have you lost sleep over it? All right, afterwards, talk to these people. These are people that have really thought about AI. To quote Ethan Mollick, who's one of my favorite writers and thinkers in this space, you haven't really experienced AI until you have had at least three sleepless nights of existential anxiety. <laughs> so if I accomplish one thing throughout this uh, talk, it'll be that you'll go home, you'll spend a lot of time with us, and you'll lose some sleep later this week. Why is that? In short, it's the unreasonable ability of machines to reason. Machines can do a lot, AI can do a lot. We've had pattern matching ML algorithms for a long time. Frankly, we did not expect machines to behave as though they are reasoning, and we can get into a whole cognitive discussion, metacognitive discussion about whether they're actually reasoning or not. But the reality is they certainly look like and behave as if they are reasoning, and that has some really profound implications for how we interact with these machines. And part of what's happened, and part of why this is so disconcerting when you think about it, is it's not really what we expected. Uh, to crib an example from uh, Thomas Friedman that he made famous in his 2016 book, human adaptability is only uh, so good. We can, we can only deal with so much change. And when we have a technology that has been improving exponentially over time, it suddenly explodes into our consciousness. And while we expect it to be in one place, we actually find ourselves in a very different place. And that gap is very disconcerting. And, and depending on, there tends to be two approaches. Either you ignore it and pretend like it doesn't exist until it suddenly slaps you upside the head, or else you dig into it and you find yourself uh, rather disoriented. And I'm not gonna go into a lot of techniques, but I wanted to kind of lay the groundwork and, and sort of provide a, a bit of a, a basis, a common understanding for why this technology has been growing exponentially. 
I, I date it really for the last decade or so. And there's three fundamental, uh, really mathematical concepts that have come up. The first is the concept of attention. So if you think about how our brains work, if you're a physician and a patient presents with you, really what you have to do is you have to distill the information of all of your past training, as well as the actual context that the patient is presenting to you, and not all the context. In the course of that conversation, they may tell you about their dog, they'll tell you about some ailments that have nothing to do with what you're talking about. And our brains have the amazing ability to sift through all that information and focus down on the context that actually matters. This turns out to be a mathematically very difficult thing to come up with. Uh, there's a, a very important and really transformative paper, not to uh, use a pun there, uh, that was based off this idea called transformers, which is basically a mathematical approach that really allows these uh, machines to very efficiently uh, learn about attention. The second concept is one that I will call self-supervision. So machine learning has been around for decades. The biggest problem, the biggest Achilles heel of machine learning is that you have to have high quality training data to train these models. And training data is uh, tedious, it takes a lot of effort, and because it's tedious, it means it's slow, it means it's expensive, it means that the training data sets we have are always way too small, it means the models that we train are inherently narrow, they're brittle in many senses of that word. Self-supervision was a new paradigm that came up within the last seven or eight years. And the idea was to really say, how do you take unlabeled data and use it to train the models how to understand the underlying latent structure of that data, sort of learning a very powerful probability distribution. And the way this works is really quite simple. If you think about it in language, what you basically do is you take all the language available, say the entire internet, and you repeatedly ask the model to predict the next word, the next word in a sentence, the next word in a paragraph, a document, a series of documents. And what you're effectively doing is you're teaching the model, you're getting the model through its attention mechanisms to learn everything from what words are similar that are, are interchangeable in a certain context, what words tend to follow each other, and essentially what's happening is, is learning the underlying semantic structure of that data. So those are both mathematical concepts that were, have been really important in the last decade. One of the things that's emerged and is, is still not really fully understood is the idea of scaling laws, what, what I think should actually be better called the scaling hypothesis. We don't really understand the physics of AI. But the idea here, put, to put simply, is more is better. More data is better, more parameters in the model is better, uh, more hours spent training, more money spent on the computer is better. And we see this bearing out over and over and over again. If you look at sort of the history of these models over the last years, we go from millions of parameters to billions of parameters to some of these top models are probably in the trillions of parameters. And what this means is not only does it explain why we've seen this exponential growth, but really, really importantly, these scaling laws are what makes it so that investors are willing to pour exponential amounts of money into the problem, which means these models keep getting bigger and more powerful. So we'll come back to these themes throughout. As I said, the, where we find ourselves now, really starting in November of 2022 and moving forward, is we suddenly have machines that in some sense of the word are able to reason. What I want to talk about today, what my team has really been focusing on, is what it means for these machines to reason over patients, over populations, and I'll touch on this a little bit, my team spends a lot of this uh, time on this, but over biology as well. And as we talk through this, I think it's helpful to keep in mind that whenever you're talking about a technology uh, a technology change, a technology disruption, it can really come in two forms. The first I'll call technology substitution, and this is really the idea that you have a new technology that slots in really neatly into existing workflows and simply improves productivity. This is the easy kind of disruption. It tends to, to move throughout an ecosystem very, very quickly. You simply drop it in, people value, and so, and so it will uh, uh, diffuse rapidly. The second kind is much more challenging but much more profound when it happens, and this is ecosystem transformation. This is when the technology actually pushes an entire fundamental shift in the entire paradigm. These are very hard to happen. It takes the entire ecosystem to make it happen, but when it happens, you end up uh, having the potential for massive productivity gains, or, or, or creativity gains, sorry. One example uh, it, that I like to think about is what Napster did to the music industry. Right? We had a whole way of distributing music that had been going on for decades. Napster blew that up. Now, Napster itself failed as a company. <laughs> But they showed the way, it was a new technology that showed what music could actually, what music distribution could be. It was a painful process, there were winners and losers in the process, there were other technologies that had to be developed. Digital rights management was critical for that to take off, for example, it had nothing to do really with what Napster was doing. But in the end, it actually connected more artists to more, uh, to more ears, really, and enabled an explosion in creativity. So what I'd like to do for a little bit is walk through some anecdotes, if you will, about reasoning over patients. And what I'm going to show you here is, is made up in the sense that I'm pretending to be a doctor and I'm not, and this is not an actual patient, but this is an actual interaction with GPT-4. 
So what I've done here is I, I, I came to GPT-4 and I said, look, I'm a doctor. I have this patient named Fern who's presented with a bunch of symptoms. What do you recommend I do? And what's really interesting about the response is a few things. First of all, it takes the context of what I've shared, just a paragraph about Fern. It takes all of its pre-training information, roughly speaking, from the internet, and it distills that down actually to two possible diagnoses. And it calls out that with what I've given, you can't actually differentiate between those two. And so it actually recommends a series of tests that I could order that would help me get to a differential and it even proposes what the treatment would be based off what the results are. So if we continue this forward, I say, great, I, I, I've ordered out those tests. I've gotten back. I see that her uh, serum concentration of C3 is low. And I'm going to jump to the conclusion that uh, she must have ARF. Now, I'm not a doctor. I actually have no idea if this is right. But I'm told that this is not the right diagnosis. And this is really actually kind of interesting, because if you look at what GPT-4 does, it's very polite, but it pushes back and says, I think you might be jumping to conclusions here. That's actually not the most likely outcome. Uh, but if you don't believe me, here's some more tests that you can order. You can order renal imaging, uh, and that might help you get to a conclusive diagnosis. Now, this is what I mean by a machine that looks like it's reasoning, a machine that's doing something that we didn't really expect machines to be able to do, not just because it can look at the actual uh, data and come up with a diagnosis, if you will, but that it can actually interact with me. It can try to convince me why I'm wrong and do so in a very constructive way. Now, I should point out, not all AIs do this. In fact, we've tried this with many of them, and, and most of them are actually trying too hard to be nice to me and will go along with whatever I say and say, oh, no, you must be right. Uh, you're a really smart human. I'll, I'll follow your lead. So we, actually, we have to be careful with these. And, and frankly, as we think about how do we take these machines and get them to interact well with humans, this alignment problem we call it, how do you get them to do what we want them to do, often can actually decrease their intelligence, if you will. <laughs> we see this uh, in many, many cases. Of course, uh, when this exploded on the scene, many, many people uh, started looking at this across the academic community. There's thousands of papers that have been uh, written on this. Here are some of my favorite ones. The one in the upper left came out in April. This, this was a, a, a pretty interesting one because it was specifically looking at how can GPT-4 uh, work on clinical reasoning of really hard uh, 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 case studies. And to quote the senior author on that, uh, what he says is, as someone who studies how doctors make decisions, this does show that large language models are capable of mimicking some of the powerful processes that we use to make diagnoses, processes that until basically last year we physicians thought were unique to us. Not surprisingly, uh, many of the uh, major medical associations and governing bodies are starting to look into this. There's lots of ethical questions around how you would use this, you can imagine. So they're starting to think through what are guidelines for this. But patients are also taking notice uh, because this technology is nothing if not accessible. Uh, there's many, many stories like this of patients, in this case a mother, uh, who'd been in the system, hadn't been able to get to a diagnosis, and was able to use GPT-4 to get to that diagnosis. As a patient, this is really exciting. As somebody that works in this industry, it's very scary. It raises lots of questions about how should people actually be interacting with the system, what happens when it goes wrong. Uh, uh, but I, I think what we can agree on is that we're seeing signs of impending ecosystem transformation here. Now, if we go back to our anecdote, one of the interesting things about these models is that they can, in some sense of the word, get into people's heads. So if I ask GPT-4, what do you think Fern might be thinking and feeling? just given the little bit that we've had in this interaction. GPT-4 jumps in and says, well, she's a child. She may be scared or confused. She might not fully understand the medical explanations. She might be concerned about the tests she's undergoing, possibility of needing a specialist. What she really needs is for her care team to reach out and be empathetic with her and help her through this process. Well, that's great. I'm not very good at interacting with kids. Do you have any ideas about how I could do this? Well, certainly. Here's, here's something that you could actually write. Here's how you could interact with this person. Here, here's some coaching for you as a physician. It turns out people have studied this. Uh, within months of ChatGPT coming out, a group at Stanford had already looked at this and found that if you do blinded tests, people on average prefer what the AI uh, tells people as opposed to what doctors tell people. I don't mean this as a slant against doctors, although I will say that as humans, while we're very good at being human, we do have finite time. We have finite patience. <laughs> Uh, not all of us are as empathetic as we can be, and AI has infinite time and infinite patience. Not surprisingly, this is starting to find its way into systems. Uh, this was a study, uh, I think this was out of uh, Ohio State University, I forget. But they've actually shown now that you can take uh, this AI, these AI sort of systems, build them into the actual workflows, and actually start generating uh, uh, draft replies. Uh, and what's really interesting is when you look at the data, this isn't actually saving much time, but what it is doing is it's saving a lot of cognitive load on the physicians and really helping them uh, in, in cases of burnout. 
Of course, you can also ask it to do more practical things. Can you just write the referral note that we need to, to, to send firm to the uh, nephrologist? Sure, it's happy to do that. Could you put this into a structured format that I can put into the electronic health uh, record? And can you please look up the ICD-10 code so that I can actually get paid? Sure, it's happy to, happy to do that as well. And what we're seeing is that this sort of technology is very easily slotted into existing workflows. Uh, there's already exist systems that will capture the patient-physician uh, interaction and put it into a transcript. And if you take that transcript, put it through a model, a single model, and are simply a little bit clever about how you prompt that model, what you tell it to do, you can actually have it put out a number of, of existing very useful artifacts. At Microsoft, a couple years ago, uh, we acquired Nuance, which is a, a company that's actually embedded into uh, many of these workflows. We already have uh, dozens of scenarios that are supported across uh, various different uh, specialties, and we're already finding uh, that this is saving on average 30 to 60 minutes per day per physician. Others have studied this and shown that more important than the actual uh, time is the impact on burnout and the stress that patients have had. I will tell you that the anecdotes here are very compelling. I uh, was recently uh, chatting with Shiv Rao, who's the CEO of actually one of our competitors, uh, Abridge, and he was sharing the anecdote of how he had gotten a story just through the user feedback channels of the technology, where a pediatrician wrote into the company to say, I just wanna let you know, last night my five-year-old asked me, mommy, why are you at dinner? And she said, because there's a new tool that means that I can be home for dinner now. In short, we're seeing signs of meaningful technology substitution. This sort of technology just fits within existing workflows. It has its limitations. There's lots that you have to do to make sure that it's working well. Uh, but it's really it's already making some profound uh, impact. What these examples also show is one of the superpowers of generative AI, which is the ability to structure unstructured information. So if we continue my little anecdote here, I've looked up on clinicaltrials.gov and I found a clinical trial that I think Fern might be eligible for. Now, if you look at these things, it's a huge amount of, roughly speaking, unstructured text that describes what the trial is, that describes the inclusion and exclusion uh, criteria. And all I've done here is I've copied all of that text, and pasted it into the chat window, and then I've asked the question, would Fern be a candidate for this clinical trial? And using all the context of our conversation, what I just, pat, what I just uh, pasted into the chat window, it's able to implicitly structure that information, describe what the condition is that it's looking for, look at the exclusion criteria, and uh, point out even that among the diagnostic tests, we've already run one of those, and conclude that Fern is likely an eligible uh, candidate for this trial. Now, if you think about what it would take to actually scale this, we probably don't want to do this with a bunch of copy and paste. Roughly speaking, there's, there's a few things we need to do, right? We need to structure the clinical trials descriptions, we need to structure the patient data, we need to design a matching algorithm, and then we need to make a UI. And this is actually something that we've been working on within my team uh, for a couple years, actually, with older generations of generative AI, uh, specifically with a, through a partnership that we have with uh, Providence. But what I want to show you is an example of how you can use these AI algorithms through the structuring, which is really the first, uh, the first step here. And all we've done here is we've taken essentially a chat window, and you can, of course, automate this. But what you do is it, it comes in three or four parts here. It starts with in three parts here. It starts with the instruction. What do I want you to do? And that has an example. Let me give you an example of how to actually do this. I'm, I'm just showing you one. Of course, you probably want to do more than one example. And then you'd have, okay, for this particular input, uh, here's what I want you to actually structure, and then the output is blank, because all these systems are is their next word predictions. If you go ahead and put all this into the context and you say, okay, what comes after output? It will happily fill that in for you. And in this case, what we've asked it to do is we've asked it to actually put out a logical string, which can now be parsed as a logical uh, tree. And once you have this, you can put it into any of your favorite uh, logical databases and you can run your favorite matching algorithms over it. If you do the same thing on the EHR side, then you can build a, a, a UI interface. This is a prototype that is actually working. Um, we meant this to be a research prototype, but it was so useful that uh, Providence is actually using this uh, daily in their molecular tumor boards to match patients to trials. To date, they've matched, uh, made a few thousand matches. And basically what it's doing here is it's taking this fictional patient, it's structuring everything we know about that patient, it's going through all the different clinical trials, not only does it show which clinical trials are there, but once you have this technology, when you click on them, you can surface why that's there, because they're not going to be 100% accurate, and then the study staff can, can look more deeply. You know, when we first started using this to match patients to clinical trials, uh, Dr. Ron Leidner at, at, at Providence reached out to us and said, hey, I have the opposite problem. I have the inverse problem. I have this very small study that is turning out to be very hard to recruit for. It was an immunotherapy trial, and, and, and finding patients was very difficult. At this point, he'd only matched two patients after a, a number of months. Could we just invert the problem? 
And of course, that was pretty easy to do. And, and within a single pass, we had hundreds of candidates and finished enrollment and, and got the results soon after that. Of course, we're not the only ones doing this. This is a, a study that came out of Mass General uh, that was uh, posted as a preprint on MedArchive a couple months ago. And they used a slightly different approach. I'm going to talk about this in a minute. But what I liked about this was they already had set up a high throughput uh, a study matching, and they already had paid, trained, but not medically licensed study staff that were doing this matching algorithm. And as part of that process, then, once people were matched, uh, physicians would come in and actually validate it. So they had the whole infrastructure set up so you could actually measure how accurate these people were. And what they did was they added in GPT-4 and basically gave GPT-4 access to a search engine into the EHRs. And what they found was that GPT-4 was as accurate or in some cases more accurate than the individuals themselves and the, than the study staff. And not surprisingly, if you do the cost analysis, it's, it's not even in the same uh, ballpark, uh, both in terms of dollars but, of course, in time as well. Again, we're seeing signs of meaningful technology su uh, substitution. This is really easy to implement, and, and people are starting to implement it uh, across the board. Now, what I'd like to do is do a little sidebar here and talk a little bit about design patterns, because I actually just showed you two, and there's a few that I think are useful to keep in mind, because uh, these will keep coming up over and over again. The first one I showed you is what I'll call in-context learning. Sometimes people call this few-shot learning. And this is not touching the model at all. We're not updating the weights. We're not giving the model access to anything else than what you can put in the chat window. All we're doing is we're giving it examples from our own domain, and it's effectively learning in real time what we want to do about that. This is proving to be an incredibly powerful design pattern, uh, not least because it's very accessible. You don't need to know how to program. You don't need to know anything about machine learning. It does take experience. It takes practice. But it's, it's really experience that anybody, any domain expert can learn. It's also, and this I think was surprising, and there's a lot of ongoing theoretical research around this, it also uh, is also proving to be incredibly statistically powerful. In many ways, this is actually the fastest way to get these models to learn. Effectively, you're getting it to use the entire corpus of knowledge, if you will, of reasoning, if you will, and allowing it to very quickly uh, shape its understanding around the few examples. This is very, very powerful. I think actually the main limitation here is how long these context windows can be. How much can you actually paste into this, uh, into these uh, chat boxes, if you will. Uh, a year and a half ago, these context windows were on the order of thousands of words. Uh, a year ago, they were on the order of 10,000s of words. Six months ago, they were 100,000s of words. They're already close to a million words. It's not always scaling well. Some of these really long ones aren't working as well, but the technology is growing very, very quickly. Once you have a million words, you can put in <laughs> an enormous amount of information into these systems. The second design pattern uh, was what this other study that I referred to was doing. And this is what we call retrieval augmented generation, or RAG. Uh, this is their design, uh, their, their architecture design. I'm not going to go through the details. But essentially what you're doing is you do a first pass where you index the information the same way Google does when they index the web. And then you basically just give uh, the AI the ability to use that search engine and then pull that information into its context and then move forward from there. This is, again, a very, very powerful approach. Uh, it, it came out at maybe two years ago and is really uh, become one of the core workhorses. Again, it's not hard. This takes a little bit of software engineering, but it's really not hard to implement. So it's a little bit step up in terms of the complication uh, and, and how hard it is to implement this. If, if we kind of keep going in that direction, the next design pattern is to give AI access to tools. Turns out these things are actually really good at writing code. And of course, most of the software world is based off of code, and we can interact with systems through APIs. And so if you give a tool that can write code the ability to execute code, then it can do uh, many, many uh, very interesting, uh, some rather scary things as well. But it's a very powerful uh, tool in our toolbox now. The next level of complication is actually fine-tuning these models. So you can take a model that was pre-trained for one domain, one general domain, and say, OK, but this isn't working very well for electronic health records because there just isn't enough uh, training data in the public domain. Say, so let's fine-tune this model. This is actually pretty complicated. It takes a lot of expertise, but it's something that is routinely done among people that have that expertise. And the last one is actually creating new models from scratch, uh, using, being very, very clever about what data go into these models. Uh, this is often called small language models. Small because the number of parameters and the size of the training data is small, but they end up being just as powerful because we're being very clever about the data that actually goes into those. Now, what kind of sits along all, the si all, all sides of this is uh, what we call agents. And this is the ability to have different models that are specialized in any one of these ways, and then have another AI system that basically coordinates between these things. And th this ends up being very powerful. So let me give you an example, kind of a toy example of how this works. Uh, so here I've taken, a, again, sort of a fake example, but I said, OK, GPT-4, here's a patient's salt intake on 10 consecutive days. Those same 10 days, I measured their blood pressure. Uh, do you see the rise in blood set, uh, pressures that are likely caused by the rise in salt intake? 
you'll be happy to know GPT-4 knows the difference between causation and correlation and it tells me as such, so that's good. Uh, but if I push that and say, okay, great, can you actually tell me how correlated is the blood pressure with salt intake? It will happily calculate that. Now, if you think about it, this version of GPT-4 that I'm running was trained on next word prediction. I have no idea how it did this math. That doesn't make any sense. We don't really understand that. In this particular case, it did the math wrong, which is a problem because that's not at all obvious if you read it. <laughs> it's directionally right, but 0.88 is not the right answer. So how do you address this? Uh, one version is to use agents. And so here's the manual way to do agents. I just took that entire output. I fired up another instance of GPT-4. I copied and pasted in those little dots right there. So I say, here's a problem and proposed solution. Copy, paste. Can you check the proposed solution for any errors? And what's really remarkable is the second instance is actually able to look at what the first instance did and say, well, that's not right. Here's the correct answer. I still have no idea how it got the right answer. It doesn't make any sense. But we've seen this over and over again that these models are much better at validation than they are at generation. It's a little bit surprising, but we actually see this in many areas of computer science. If you're finding the shortest way through a graph or, or a path from node A to node B in a graph, it's much harder to find that than it is to validate that you actually have a path from node A to node B. And it's kind of a similar concept here. This can be operationalized very easy in agents. In fact, it's very easy to set up a system where you essentially have a commander that takes the input, farms out the work to a writer, takes the output of that, sends it to an editor. You can have different types of editors. We often find that it's useful to have one editor that's specifically prompted to look for errors of omission, another one that's specifically prompted to look for hallucinations, and you get the idea. Of course, another solution is to simply give GPT-4 the power to use tools. So here's the exact same uh, question. Uh, last summer, G uh, OpenAI uh, gave GPT-4 the ability to write and execute Python code. So if you, if you run this in the current version, it doesn't even try to compute it itself. What it actually does is it writes code. And if you click on that, it is very reasonable Python code. It will execute that code, it will interpret that code, and it will give you the right answer. Again, this is very, very powerful. It's also very scary, so these things tend to be very sandboxed because you don't want them just going off and, I don't know, making trades on the uh, open market for you or anything like that. Um, but it's a very power powerful paradigm. The other point, of course, is that these things can work together. Uh, so if we take the example of clinical trial matching, I showed you one example where we we're using the AI fundamentally to structure data. Once you structure that data, it's in a database, and of course at that point you can use the RAG model. So that's very powerful, but of course if something's in a structured database, you don't have to just use AI, you can also use any other tool that's in our statistical machine learning toolbox that has been developed over the last you know, three, four, five decades. So as an example of that, when we first structured this with, uh, again, working with Providence, we asked the question, okay, if you've structured all of the EHR data, can you actually use that to simulate clinical trials? So the, sim the, the example here is a little complicated, but it's roughly straightforward here. In the upper left, we use the large language models to structure the information. Once it's structured, it's just in a table and you can use any tool in the toolbox. In our case, we use some AI tools to deal with noisy data, to deal with missing data, just some statistical tools to throw out any patients that look suspicious. And then you can go through any uh, control, uh, randomized control trial specification, you can exactly model that. You can use tools from causal modeling to deal with confounders. And then you can, of course, put on a user interface. How do you validate a system like that? We went through and we found a bunch of uh, actual published randomized control trials. And we said, can we take the specifications of those control trials, run them through Providence's EHR, and do we get uh, hazard ratios that are within the 95% confidence bounds? I should point out, we didn't actually do this. Providence does this uh, themselves, because it's, uh, as you can imagine, very personal and private data, and we don't want access to that. But what we find is that this actually works very, very, very well. Now, if you think about what we just did here, we have a system that can take real-world data, can structure it, and can match, that, match patients to clinical trials. If you can do that, then of course you can optimize clinical trials, because all that's doing is beforehand looking at the inclusion and exclusion uh, criteria to identify what subpopulations are at highest risk and are most likely to benefit, which of course gets the, the drugs to the right people. It also makes those trials much uh, cheaper because you don't need to enroll as many people. If you can do that, in principle, you can do a virtual control arm. Uh, the whole idea of a control arm is that you're looking at standard of care, but we have a million patients. Why don't we just use uh, history as standard of care? If you can do that, you can do post-market comparative effectiveness, right? A virtual study that actually says, okay, we've already run these two drugs. Which one is working better and which subpopulations? Uh, as we get to the subpopulations, you really want to get into what's going to work better for the patient in front of me. Probably the best way to do that to start is to find cases that match this person. Effectively, you're taking the person, you're turning that into enrollment criteria, and then you look for patients that are like that person, and you surface them as a case study. Of course, if you can do that, you can effectively do n equals one person uh, virtual trials. 
And really, we are getting to, down the path of real-world evidence, which is to say, how do we learn from people to treat the person? This has been a goal of real-world evidence for a decade and a half or so. What I think is really remarkable is at this point, I don't think the bottleneck is machine learning. It's not the statistics. The bottleneck is everything else in the system. Right? Where does the data, who owns that data, uh, what are the ethical guidelines for using that data? Are these patients really consented? What does it mean to even consent for something like this? Uh, what are the business models for all this? It's really not a technical question. It's an ecosystem question. Of course, medicine is about more than text. Uh, you know, these, these medical records are great. Here's actually a representation of a, a real uh, a patient's medical record in, in a cancer patients, and they interact with the system uh, in very complicated ways. In the end, what we get is a bunch of human descriptions, human summaries about various tests that have been ordered. But of course, the pathology report is a human summary of an actual pathology image, and the radiology report is a summary of the actual radiology image. And of course, for many of these patients, we have at least genetic markers, and over time, we'll have full genomes. There's new technologies measuring, uh, measuring proteins. Uh, you can imagine all sorts of other modalities coming. And what we want is these systems not to simply reason over what humans have already reasoned over, but to actually reason over the primary data of biomedicine directly. What I'll say is that if 2023 was a year of large language models where that really exploded into the public consciousness because of a massive step forward in the technology, 2024 is already proving to be the year of large multimodal models, which is to say pulling in together different uh, types of modalities. Let me give you a, a fun example of this. Uh, a few months ago, uh, all these major models from OpenAI, from Google, from Anthropic, uh, gained the ability to not just reason about text, but about images as well. And so what, what, I, what I did here was I found an old audiology report that I had in my files of my, of my own. And I have to tell you, as a patient, I have no idea what this means. I mean, I vaguely remember what the audiologist told me, but this is very cryptic. There's some graph in here that I don't know what it means. There's I, what I assume is supposed to be helpful, uh, it notes that the audiologist has written in the bottom, but it's all shorthand that means nothing to me. But if I just take a picture of this with my phone and paste it into ChatGPT and ask the question, can you help me understand this? It actually breaks it all down for me. It tells me what the different symbols mean. It tells me what the graph means. It tells me what the individual like, handwritten notes mean. And it tells me in the end that, that it looks like I have some minor hearing loss in my left ear, which is true. So you can see where this is going. This is pretty profound. Unfortunately, if you give it a pathology image, it won't work at all. And why is that? There's a couple reasons. One is simply there's not enough pathology image data in the public domain, which is roughly what these models are trained off of. But there's also uh, very specific uh, challenges for things like pathology data. These images are enormous. If you actually print these things out on standard resolution, the image would take up the size of a tennis court. At the same time, the actual features you're looking for, mitotic divisions, cell morphology, are relatively tiny. And it's not covering the whole, it's not like a picture of a cat that takes up a major part of the image. It might be just a handful of cells in a tiny corner of this image. Our current attention mechanisms do not deal well with this. So what do we do with this? I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but, but just to give you a flavor, I just worked for my own group. I just last month, we uh, working with a company called Page. Uh, we published a new foundation model. And really the idea was first, how do you be a little more cl uh, clever about the self-supervision really through data augmentation techniques? But then how do you just apply scale? They've digitized uh, millions of different pathology images, and if you just apply that scale, what do you get out of it? And the result was a single model that was as good or better than all of the clinical, model, clinical grade models that Paige already had in the clinic. It was as good as the models for common cancers, and it was better than the models for rare diseases, for rare cancers, which goes to show that what, part of what these models is doing is they're really abstract, extracting common features so that in the rare cases, we don't have enough training data for the old style of machine learning models, we can transfer the data from the, the, the learnings from the uh, more common cancers into those rare cancers. A couple months before, we did uh, work actually with a, a group here at University of Washington, as well as with Providence. And here we were looking at the question, well, how do you look at a whole slide? For many of these, actually, for, for the work uh, uh, with Paige, we're just looking at tiles. Because again, when you're looking at cancer, it turns out you only need to find a couple little patches. You don't need to look at the whole slide. But if you want to study the tumor microenvironment, per se, per, uh, for example, you really want to get that broader context. And so this was a building on some new work uh, out of our, our uh, lab over in Beijing that showed how you can actually take these attention mechanisms and make them much more scalable, make them so they grow linearly instead of quadratically in terms of the number of tokens, and, and allow you to actually reason across very long distances. And again, we were able to get a very general foundation model. And one of the really interesting features here was that when we looked at the benchmarks, we found that we were able to, uh, through the image alone, identify 
with maybe 70% accuracy, a number of genetic mutations. And these, this means that these are genetic mutations that are driving cell morphology changes, most of which are imperceptible to the human eye. Which again is reasons why we think that getting models like this are not just going to be useful for clinical diagnosis, but for extracting more information about the human uh, themselves. Here's another example uh, uh, from our, our group in the UK that works more in the radiology space. And the idea here was how do you take a radiology image and actually generate the findings? People have been working on this for a long time. Turns out in order to do this really well, you need to have not just a, mo a model that understands check x-rays in this case, but a model that can look at past check x-rays, uh, different angles. Also, the context of why was the x-ray ordered. In fact, people have studied this. If you give the same x-ray to multiple uh, radiologists and don't tell them why it was ordered, you'll get wildly different results because that context really matters. And so you really need a model that understands both the language and the image in order to generate these findings. But of course, when you generate the findings, how do you know they're right? And part of what we think is really important is the explainability of these models. So how do you make it so the model will actually explain its work? In this case, for every individual finding that actually highlights a box on the image saying this is a region of the image that led to this finding. It turns out that actually makes the model more accurate. And of course, it also makes it much more interpretable. And we think that might actually be useful not just for radiologists, but for downstream users who are trying to understand what the radiologist wrote. Here's another example we posted uh, on GitHub a couple months ago, and this is really about how, how do you train a model end-to-end -end for all the tasks of imaging, whether it's uh, segmentation, object detection, or object classification, and do it jointly with text so that you can ask questions of images, like uh, can you identify the liver cells, can you identify the, the, uh, the immune cells, and so on and so forth. So this highlights another design pattern. I just want to call out, and I won't go into too much detail, but it, it's a very useful design pattern, I think, as we think about what is the future of these multimodal models. And the idea is this. If I already have a fixed language model, OpenAI has already spent however many billion dollars making their language model. I'm not going to recreate that. <laughs> but maybe I need to cr create my own pathology model for all the reasons we just described. Now that I have these, how do I make it so that an imaging model and a text model can interact so I can actually ask questions of that model? And, and the paradigm is really kind of straightforward. If you actually take that image and shove it through the image model, what you get out of it is a series of tokens. You can think of them as words, but they're completely unintelligible to us as humans. And frankly, they're unintelligible to the language model that's never seen this before. But it turns out that you can actually train what's called an adapter that simply translates those tokens into a language, if you will, that the, the text model can understand. And now once you combine these things, you end up with a model that can actually uh, make really uh, useful questions and answers. And what's interesting about the model, there's many different details I'm extracting here, and there's a very active area of research, and there's different ways you can do this. Uh, but it turns out you can do this with very limited data. If you look at the title of, of the, the particular uh, uh, reference from my group that I'm, I'm pointing to, the title is Training a Large Language and Vision Assistant for Biomedicine in One Day. We did this with a single, uh, a, in a single day on a single uh, computer because it's very, very efficient, both in terms of data and in terms of compute, if all you're trying to do is, is learn that translation uh, layer. So this is a paradigm that's really led to uh, this explosion, the use of multimodal AI in the last year. I'm not going to go into too much details here, but I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that proteins are languages too. So you could take the same ideas we just talked about, apply them to proteins. Uh, this is a work that my team posted online uh, back in September of last year because of how reviews go and how hard it is to validate these things. It's still ongoing because unlike text where you can, you can run a test that any one of us can look at and say, yeah, that makes sense, or you can give it to an expert. When you generate a protein, you have no idea if what you just created is useful or not. So it's a, it's a whole process to validate this. I'd say actually that validation step is one of the things that's really holding back the field here. But the, the concept is the same. How do you get a model that can predict the next amino acid, do so in context, and do so in a way that you can actually generate either new proteins from scratch or proteins that fill in, do what's called inpainting, to fill in a particular active region of a protein, or scaffolding, if you have an antigen, how do you create everything around that to actually present the antigen on the vaccine, say. Uh, these models are not as good as the text models, but they also, as early days, we and everybody else is training on very small amounts of data, and I think it's only a matter of scale before these become really, uh, truly powerful. Of course, we and others are also applying this to DNA, uh, to molecules, to cells. What does it mean to model a cell? If you think about uh, transcriptomics, say, uh, cell expression is not inherently ordered the way a protein sequence or human language is. Uh, so there's work that has to be done, but frankly, it's not that hard, and I think it's inevitable this will be solved uh, in relatively a uh, short time. Now, I'd be remiss if I did not point out all of the problems. Uh, these things make stuff up. Uh, they're terrible at math. Uh, we don't really understand what they're doing at some level. Uh, they reflect the biases of the data on which they're trained, which uh, if any of you have ever been on the internet, you know that's a problem. 
Uh, there's lots of questions about data access uh, and privacy there. Uh, the ethics and regulation are completely underdeveloped. Uh, we don't really have uh, good frameworks within, with, with, within which to operate. In short, the demos are really, really easy. The real world is hard. Uh, I, this is one thing that I, I, I both encourage everybody to go off and make demos and also be skeptical of any demo you see <laughs> because they are really easy. And my rule of thumb is that any demo will work probably 80% of the time and sometimes that's good enough and oftentimes it's not. That said, the nature of being an exponential growth curve is many of these things are rapidly changing. I, I started presenting this slide about 20 months ago and the differences in, in hallucinations, for example, through things like agents, uh, through grounding, uh, through these rag-based approaches is really profound and it's getting a lot better. Uh, I already showed you how you can solve the math problem by just giving access to tools. And at the same time, organizations like OpenAI, uh, Google, uh, Anthropic are learning how to train these models to do math innately, so they're getting much better there. Explainability is an interesting one. What do we mean by explainability? I think oftentimes really what we need is we need each phrase that really matters. We need to understand how it got that answer. And as I showed you with radiology, we're already getting uh, ways to do that. People have been looking at this for text as well. And again, even the biases, we're finding that if you use these agent-based frameworks, these machines are very good at detecting other AI's biases, which actually becomes a very useful framework to actually uh, identify some of these. To me, the bigger problems are really on data access and the ethics and regulation. I'll come back to that in a minute. As I said, we've been on this exponential growth curve and it's been driven by attention, self-supervision, and scaling. Uh, we can ask the question of whether this is gonna continue or not. We don't really know if it will. The fact, though, that we've already hit meaningful productivity gains and that we're starting to see the signs of ecosystem transformation means, I'd say as a fact, well, I don't know if the technology is going to continue to grow exponentially. I do know that the economics are driving exponential increases in the investment. Uh, so it would, I think, be a mistake to bet against this uh, continued growth. Of course, what that means is that our gap, if we don't pay attention, our gap in what we think the technology can do and what it can actually do is going to continue to grow. At the same time, uh, for folks like you in this room that are actually paying attention, this, I think, presents a tremendous opportunity because it's, it's times like these where we get big shifts in the technology where we can actually take a step back and ask, well, what new questions can we ask now? What new paradigms are possible? And I think it's really critical that the domain experts are the ones that are actually uh, asking those questions. I'm going to end with a, a, a bit of what I will call an anecdote, and I mean that because uh, I'm, I'm going to show you some, some really early work from our team that actually came out of a hackathon, and we haven't really thought about this as deeply as I would have liked, but, it, but hopefully it, it seeds some conversation and some thinking. So last year's Microsoft Hackathon, some folks on my team asked the question, can we use AI to help connect individuals to needed services? The idea was basically, we're doing all this stuff in healthcare and biology, can we just take what we've learned, and in the course of a hackathon, which is a week, we actually plug together in a meaningful way ways that we can help individuals access the services that, that they require and frankly that, that they are uh, uh, entitled to. I'm going to tell you all that, that a shocking number of Americans uh, can't afford basic necessities. Uh, these numbers are of course not only a moral uh, tragedy, they're a huge economic problem and they're a huge healthcare problem too, right? I mean, some, depending on how you count, some 80% of healthcare outcomes are determined by social determinants. Uh, Dr. Shaw talked about some of that uh, earlier today. And the reality is that there actually are available services for a lot of people and, and one of the bottlenecks is simply matching people to those services. Um, one of the organizations that does an amazing job of this is United Way and the two-on-one system. This is basically a nationwide system where in almost any location in the USS, you can dial 211 on the phone and it will connect you to an actual person that will help you through uh, whatever it is you need, whether it's connecting to housing services, healthcare, and so on and so forth. So we got connected with United Way a bit ago and, and, and you know, one of the things they flagged for us is that the biggest problem is, is two things. One is simply volume. There's, there's more need than they have resources to, in terms of the, the call centers to actually respond to, but also even finding and surfacing the information. The way this information is distributed is uh, rather Byzantine and siloed. So again, this was just a one-week hackathon project, but we asked the question, could we actually put together a chatbot that could access some of the data from these two-on-one services and make a useful interface? And we, we've kind of, I'm showing you two different versions here. On the left is an interface that's really designed for individuals uh, in the community that would reach out and say, hey, I, I'm looking for you know, whatever I need. And then the, the other paradigm is really more for care workers to be able to uh, follow up as well. Now, this opens up some really interesting scenarios. Uh, again, th this is kind of early days. I just kind of want to, for food for thought, some of the scenarios we're starting to think through with United Way and others. Uh, one might be for an individual uh, like Larry here who uh, lives at home, uh, has multiple chronic conditions, and importantly, doesn't drive. 
right? So how would an AI system help somebody like this? Uh, you can imagine a system that understands Larry's background, being able to even just proactively reach out and say, hey, Larry, have you gotten your flu shot yet? And recognizing, because of its history, because it knows Larry, that the problem is not getting the flu shot, the problem is getting to the place to get the flu shot. And so, Larry, how, how can we actually help you with that? And then following up sometime later, have you actually gotten it? If not, why? What's going on? Uh, maybe the, maybe the, the shuttles are not the right way. What happens if we just arrange an Uber service for you? And if you think about it, you could tell Larry how to get a, an Uber, but these tools can also interact with APIs. And so in principle, this tool could actually order the Uber for him. And I'll tell you, there actually are um, very successful startups that are doing this um, in pretty profound ways. In New York City, there's one, for example. Uh, where the, the services are actually directly calling the Ubers. Of course, you have to think about who's paying for that, how do you connect it through all the services, but, but in principle, that, that's quite doable. Or in a healthcare setting, when you have a new mom, how do you have a, a system that follows up after she leaves uh, delivery and can follow up with, with simple questions like, how are you doing? Uh, how are things going? Uh, can I connect you to a, a, a telehealth representative that seems like you need some help right now, and so on and so forth. If you think about how do people get connected into these systems, uh, one of the things that we've explored a little bit with some folks is what happens if you actually build this in directly into uh, the medical encounter directly? So as I said, we already have systems that can capture the transcript of a conversation between a patient and provider. What happens if during that transcript, uh, Mary makes the comment that she's struggling to uh, pay her utility bills right now? We already have legal systems and, and processes where community care workers can get connected to these people. Uh, at the point of care, but that, that connection point and that follow through is often, uh, is often missed. So how would you have an AI system that can actually extract that right away, pull in the care worker, maybe even do the initial reach out, uh, out, outreach to the individual? You can see where this is going. I think, I think the possibilities are endless. Um, I'm, I'm going to end in maybe a little bit of unorthodox way, which is to show you an architecture diagram. <laughs> And what I want to show is just what it took to put this together. Like I said, this was a week-long hackathon project, and, and all the pieces were relatively straightforward. You start on the left side, you get the data. In this case, from uh, the 211 centers, you ingest it. We do the indexing and the structuring like we talked about it. We put it in a database so we can use these RAG models. We knew that we needed memory. You don't want to update these models because you don't want actually Mary's details going into some universal model. That would be no good. But what you can do is you can create another database that basically keeps track of the interactions, and you can use that as part of the RAG system. You can use that to trigger follow-ups. Of course, you might need access to the web. There's different modalities that you might want to interact with the individuals, not just through an app, but through text, through voice, et cetera. And then there's the app, and of course, identity management. The point here is that the challenges are not so much the tech stack. It's not even the AI. The challenges are really at the far left and the far right. What data goes into the system? I mean, 2 on one is a great program. It is very fragmented. Right? There, there is no universal database of all of these interactions. There is no even single organization that we can partner with to roll this out across the US. We're working with West Tennessee, which is great. I hope that works. I don't know how we work with Washington. Right? Each of these becomes a, a separate conversation we need to have. Uh, at the same time, in our, in our introducing this into the medical record, we know technically how to do that. There's even legal systems that mean that the patients have the right to have access to this data. There's even standards and rules from uh, CMS that require that third-party apps can have access to that data if the patient uh, grants that access. But having rules and it, even standards does not mean they're well implemented, does not mean they're easy to use, and there's some, some major barriers there. On the other end, what should the user experience actually look like? And by this, I don't just mean what does the app look like, but what should actually be enabled? Is it okay for us to order an Uber? What happens if it's right only 99% of the time, but 1% of the time it, shows, it drives Larry to the wrong location? Like, who's following up on that? What happens if Larry doesn't show up and the Uber driver uh, ends up running up a bunch of bills? Many of these agents are, you know, one of the big problems is actually filling out forms. We have agents that are starting to be able to fill out forms for people. Is that okay? Like, is that okay legally? Is it okay ethically? What happens if we get those wrong? Uh, and, and so on and so forth. As we saw with the example with Simone, these systems actually are pretty good at, uh, at counseling. In fact, there's startups that have systems that are actively used for counseling that then escalate to humans, and they are doing very well. But that raises a lot of questions about, do you want the system to intentionally do that? I certainly don't want it to accidentally do that, and how do we stop that? In many of these scenarios, we know we need human oversight. How do we, who is doing that oversight? How do we connect, when should the system actually escalate to that human oversight? And all this really uh, raises profound ecosystem questions. How do you do this in a sustainable way? Because it's one thing to build a tech stack once and make it available. This, this takes a whole, a whole village, as it were, to really make this work and to do so in a way that is uh, economically sustainable. So in many ways, I hope this is kind of the start of the discussion today. Uh, as, as Dr. Shaw said, at the end of the day, AI is just another tool. 
uh, I think it's a very profound tool. I think it will profoundly shape how we interact with technology at the very least, and has the potential to profoundly shape how we actually interact with the health system and how we take care of our own health. It's also a very weird tool. Uh, in many ways, it behaves more like a human. It, may, it behaves more like uh, that intern or graduate student you have, or maybe were, that was both uh, shockingly good at some areas and then puzzlingly terrible at other areas because they haven't learned yet. And we don't always know when it's going to be good and when it's going to be bad. I'm very confident it's going to continue to get better. So one thing I always say is if it doesn't work right now, maybe don't solve the problem and just come back in six months and maybe it will solve the problem. And so you kind of have to have that, that lens when you look at it. But if you look at the history of medicine and the history of invention of new tools, it's never the inventor of the tool that really shapes the outcome. It's people that are working at the interdisciplinary uh, interface that are able to look at the tool and ask not just how will this make my life better now, but what new questions can I now ask? What is the new paradigm going to be? Uh, hopefully today is, is a catalyst for some of those discussions. So that, thank you very much. Um, I, I think we have time for a little bit of questions um, or discussion. Um, but thank you again for the invitation. Really appreciate being here.